Uh, so we've been talking about the, the, the faith, the faith of the Son of God, <clears throat> and what we mean by that is what he lives by, and that he believes that if you give yourself selflessly by Christ, whether it's through his nature or literally his life, you know, and you're in conjunction with his death and resurrection, then there is a resurrection that comes from that, or there is life that comes out of it. Um, <clears throat> so I wrote, if this is the case, then faith is not something that we use, <clears throat> and use it from time to time in order to get things, but it sets the tone for our lifestyle. It's not something we're using it's something that is setting the tone for how we live. <clears throat> Faith is used by so many Christians as a means by which they control their surroundings and make their lives more comfortable instead of losing their lives and living by his. They use faith's power to resist the devil but are unknowingly at times resisting God and his place for them to live by Christ and the cross. They gain victory over their finances and over the devil, but not over themselves. <clears throat> and why? Because the general understanding is, I'm okay, the, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, therefore the problem in this world is the devil and is, you know, everyone else. <laughs> Even if they're Christians, they're not the same as, you know, me. <clears throat> but in reality, God is, God is using these things. He's using faith not to fix ourselves. He's using the faith to fill us with his son to live by another life. Okay, after stating the things in Philippians 3.10, which, you know, I, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. After stating these things, the apostle talks about others imitating him in this manner, and that's down in uh, verse 17 and 18. Others imitating him in this manner rather than being enemies of the cross. So that's what he's talking about. And he's not wanting them to be enemies of the cross. He's wanting them to live by the crucified lamb um, and to be followers of Paul because he lives that way. It is in this spirit, embracing this reality, that he challenges the Philippians to imitate him. <clears throat> okay, in light of our death and removal by means of the cross, in light of our death and removal by means of the cross, but being raised as vessels of new life, the only option is a life of selfless giving by the life of Christ within. There's only one option. If you're dead and removed and Christ is now your life and this is the, the way that he lived, the life that he lived, you know, by loving me, by giving himself for me, I have no other option. There is no other option. This is, and we'll get into this, but this is the resurrection life. <clears throat> um, that means that if we understand the cross correctly and comprehend our resurrection as containers of Christ, that means our resurrection is as a container of Christ, then there will be a firm rede rejection of self-reliance. Doesn't that make sense? There's not going to be any self-reliance. There's no self. You can't have reliance on something that's dead. And the only person that has self-reliance is the person who hasn't recognized that he's dead. I mean, really recognize it. Because if you really recognize it, then you, you go, you know, I'm dead. Christ is my life. Now I will re rely on him. What was it? There was oh, some thought today when I was spending time with the Lord. Oh, it was so good. Just refreshing. Um, <clears throat> 
To be self-directed would be one of the greatest enemies of the cross. Amen? Because you're, you're, the cross is your enemy then because you want self. You know, we say, well, being self-directed, I'm my own person. <laughs> well, then you stand on your own before God too. How about that, potatoes? You know? Um, you know, that old bumper sticker, Jesus is my co-pilot. I always say, well, let him move over and drive or you're going to kill him. <clears throat> so to be self-directed would be one of the greatest enemies of the cross, even, that, even if that direction was toward a moral life by means of the law. I am self-directed, but my direction is towards the law, and I want to be a more moral person. Well, you're already immoral by doing it that way. Or at least showing that you, you will eventually manifest that you can't keep the law. To embrace the faith requires a total allegiance to the cross and to the life of resurrection, which is Christ. We are raised as the body of Christ, the vessel of the life of him who is the resurrection. All right. So that's all great teaching and theology, isn't it? I mean, this is some great stuff. And there are people all over the world, you know, not, you know, vast numbers, but there are people in places that believe that we died with Christ and that we are now the body of Christ. But not all of these people have it beyond a theological view. They still have much self-reliance because they have much self. And you, you know, how are you going to get, I mean, come on, how are you going to get rid of self if you don't do it through Christ crucified? Self will never really kill self. You know, the other day is a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, and I've seen it happen before where Rocky would, would corner a, a possum. And, uh, boy, as soon as he'd get it cornered, it would, you play dead. And I mean, you would think it's dead. You would think it's dead. And so Rocky almost walked off a couple of times. I said, wait a minute, hold it. Hold your ground here, buddy. You know, be, you know man up and realize that what you thought was dead ain't dead. <laughs> Just hold your ground because you'll see it get up and try to walk off. <laughs> and, you know, it is, it is so us because, well, I, I, no, no. You know, I mean, I can see it in Rocky's little mind because, you know, he, he was doing his job, you know. I mean, for those of you who don't know, Rocky is a fierce armadillo hunter. I mean, he is. I mean, he's a great hunting dog. He looks different. He just, everything about him changes. But anyway, in this case, he's, you know, he's only gotten a couple of possums, and they were all in our yard. And, and uh, in this case, he's, you know, the first case that I remember, he was, you know, he walked off several times. I said, Rocky, here, you know. And as soon as I'd see it move, Rocky, here. And Rocky go, what? You know. And then he'd look it up at me like I'm God and go, I would have swore that was dead, you know. <laughs> You know? <laughs> and I said, well, buddy, I love you, but it ain't dead! <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, so how do you, you know, and this was, when, this was me in Bible school too. How do you know if it's dead or not? If you leave it alone for a little while, if it gets up. I'm, I'm serious. This was, this was, this was the road that I took, and I don't know that everybody takes the same road to get to the same thing, but the road I took was anytime I declared something dead and then saw it living the next day, I said, I'm not giving up. I'm not stopping on the cross. 
I said, I'm not going to stop. This clearly is just my theological belief, and I clearly it's not dead, and I believe that you mean literally that it will not be a factor anymore that Christ can actually live in me, and if you don't mean that, I don't even want this kind of teaching. That's how I felt. I mean, I was, you remember, man, I was, you know, I was determined in my own life, I, was, I wasn't looking at everybody else. I was looking and going, oh, pfft, you know. And I remember getting frustrated at myself and going, and going look at that, you know. See, you, you, you're confessing that you're dead. And, you, you know, what do you think, that the confession of it? No, the confession is, you know, it's like, you know, I hate to put it this way, but if I died, Deb say, you know, called up and say, well, you know, he died. You go, oh, is that what put him to death? No, not the confession of it. He just died, you know. He just died. The reality of it is what I'm confessing. Can I get amen? You confess the reality. You don't confess it into existence, you know? <clears throat> and so, uh, because it already exists. The truth is that you're already dead with Christ. That happened 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> All right, so let's see, where am I? Um, to embrace the faith requires a total allegiance to the cross and the life of resurrection, which is Christ. We are raised as the body of Christ, the vessel of the life of resurrection. All right. The very act of the cross was Jesus's, Jesus expressing faith towards the Father pertaining to life out of death. All right. Let me say that again. This is what we're, in this sentence is what we're going to find is we're going to find the, the, the faith that Paul lived by. Excuse me. I'm allergic to the cross. No. <laughs> like, 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 all, well, yeah, like all of us. Um, so, so listen carefully. The very act of the cross, meaning the very fact that Jesus was willing to go there and did go there knowing how bad it was going to be. The very act of the cross was Jesus expressing faith towards the Father pertaining to life out of death. Okay. So was it, was it easy for Jesus to go to the cross? No. And he was the Son of God. But he had a faith. And this faith wasn't just that he would be raised. You do realize that, don't you? You do understand that his resurrection was ours. You know, the new man rose out of that. It wasn't selfish on his part. Hallelujah. I love Jesus. I love this Jesus. I love his nature. <clears throat> and... You know, and any Christian can say, oh, I love Jesus. I love his nature. Anybody can say that. But the truth is, when we get in our circumstances, you'll see how much you love his nature or how much you love yourself. Come on. You'll see it. And you know what? If you just wake up, you'll see it over and over and over and over and over and over. And you, you know, and after a while, if you're, if you're really pursuing him, You'll get sick of it. And instead of looking in the mirror and saying, I'm gorgeous, you'll look in the mirror and go, oh, my God, oh, wretched man that I am. Or woman, as may be the case. A wretched one that I am. Okay, why? Well, I don't know. Paul could be good looking and still be wretched and say nothing counts for anything, nothing counts for anything except I must have Jesus. And I'm not gonna give up. And every time I see anything in me that, that is contrary to the cross, it's gonna drive me back to the Word, to the Holy Spirit, and make me cry out and just say, no, I'm not stopping. And that's, you know, again, I that's, that was my pursuit when I was in Bible school. I wasn't pursuing good grades or whatever. 
I was pursuing the Lord to know, to, to, know, to know him, but to know that the him that I was seeing in the scripture was going to be revealed in me so that I would no longer live, but Christ would live. Now, that process began in Bible school, didn't it? It began in Bible school, but it's still going on. And, and uh, some of you the other night, what was it, Sunday night, when I kind of read some stuff that opened my guts up and, you know, showed the struggles that I'd gone through and still go through, but I, but they were, you know what, they weren't struggles of my flesh in the earth, they're struggles of the kingdom. I wanted the kingdom rule in me by Christ. I could have just said, oh, you know, I'm having a hard time, or I could have said any number of things, but I went, no, I'm having this hard time because I won't just let it go, you know? And I figured in the long run, it would be worth it to have Christ. Because here was what I, I kept saying. I didn't get saved to just be a Christian. This is my life. And I, I didn't get saved to be a professional minister. I went, this is my life. When I got saved, this is what I do. Somebody, you know, what are you going to do? You know, my friends, Larry and all them, what are you going to do? You know, I, I'm going after Jesus. I don't know what else. This is what I'm going to do now. The thought never ever occurred to me that I was going to do anything less than just pursuing my Jesus and in the early stages it was follow Jesus and in the middle stages and latter stages it is that that Jesus I'm following at the cross will be formed in me and you know no man's perfect yet nobody's perfect I mean we all stumble over the same sin nature, don't we? Don't we? All of us stumble over the same sin nature. So why are we so judgmental? Well, my sin nature's better than yours. <laughs> really? I mean, is that, the, I mean, is that what we're coming away? Yeah. No? You know? Well, I'm, you know, I'm glad that the Holy Spirit gives me the words because I don't think like that. I don't, I, I've never thought my sin nature's better. Or, you know, well, I have less sin nature than you. Well, I, I don't think so. It's either Adam or it's not Adam. You know, we go, well, yeah, but, you know, part of him is dead. <laughs> you know, really? So what are you, half Adam and half Jesus? Is that what you're trying to tell me here? You know? The old man, you, someone says, well, yeah, well, you, we got two natures. We got two natures and they're fighting within me, you know, the yin and the yang, and all that. <laughs> you know, and the, that's what that is. And these two natures are fighting with inside of me. I got news for you, one of them's dead. And you're either gonna let Jesus, if he's the one dead, rise from the dead in you and be your resurrection, or you're gonna leave the other one alive and say, I'm serving Jesus with this old nature. And he's happy with that. Are you happy with it? Are you happy with the, just living by the old nature and believing that Jesus is happy with it? So somewhere, you know, somewhere, the crisis of the cross has got to devastate you. There is no hope for you continuing to pursue Jesus unless you've been devastated by the cross. I've called it in the past a mortal wounding. And I remember, I remember as I was pursuing the Lord, and I remember going to the Word and the Spirit of God revealing Christ, but He would show me the cross. And it's like He would, he would swing and it would like wound my arm, you know, and I'd walk away and go, oh, oh my God, you know, the cross is having an effect, you know. And then later I'd come back and and, uh, and it's like I, I'm, the Holy Spirit is standing there like some sort of a, you know, man, what is it, garden, the, the bridge of death or something, and uh, the black knight, some sort of knight, 
and and you know he comes and I, and he would just you know I'm sitting there trying to get across the bridge to the fullness of Christ and he's going no you got this he hit me in the leg and I go oh you know and I remember walking away knowing oh I, you know I'm gonna have to come back later and I kept coming to that bridge and he kept wounding me in some manner and I will never forget the day that I walked up to him and he took that sword and he swung it and it literally went across my belly. My guts poured out and I grabbed him with my hands. This is the picture that he gave me. I grabbed him with my hands. And I looked up at the Holy Spirit and I looked back down and went, oh my God, I'm not going to recover this time. I'm not going to make it through. I'm, this is it. This is the mortal wounding. There's n there is no hope anymore. Uh, the cross was just was revealed in such reality that I knew this is the mortal wounding and this little playing around on this side of the, the bridge trying to get into the fullness of Christ. It's over. Well, we can, you know, we can all say that's happened to me. I mean, God knows, man, I, I, God had to redefine like 50 times to me in all these years what bottom of the barrel means. Because I remember going, I'm at the end, I'm at the bottom of the barrel, I'm, this is it, Lord, this is it, I know it is, I know it is. He goes, shut your wine in the name. He says, stand on your tiptoes. You can see over the top of the barrel. <laughs> you know, stop whining. Stop living in the earth. Stop thinking about yourself. And that's why you're crying. You're not crying because you want me. You're crying for yourself. Stop it. And he said, that's what, you know, stop it. Stop it. You, you're going to keep this up forever. You'll never get there. Stop it. Well, don't, if there's no determination, I promise you, God isn't just going to put a leash around you, you know, and go, okay, come on. I know you don't want to. It's got to be a free will offering. You know, it does. It has to be. And, you know, he will do little things for you along the way, and you'll think those little things, because it's God, this is it, you know, this is it. And he's going, no, you hadn't even got close yet. <laughs> you know, you, you're about three weeks out of Egypt, <laughs> you know. In Galatians 5, 6, the faith he talks about is trust in life out of death, that's faith, that works through the spirit of self-giving love. In Romans 6, the object of your faith is not just Christ. In Romans 6, the object of your faith is not just Christ, but in the crucified Christ that affects you and not just saves you mystically. It is the way Christ lived his life in death that draws us to cross living also. The way Christ lived, Christ lived his life in death that draws us to cross living because like Paul, you begin to determine the nature of, what we, sometimes we say the nature of the cross or we call it Christ crucified more commonly around here. Um, are the spirit of the lamb and you look and you begin to look into oh my god you begin to go past the veil and you begin to look and you see him and it's not a story or it's not something someone told you or something you read in a book all of a sudden you begin to really really see Jesus and you go you're you're the cross. I mean, you know, because we made the cross so big, you know, but you're the cross. The cross never would have happened without your nature. 
No one, you know, there were the Romans crucified thousands upon thousands of people. Do you realize that? And not one of them died selflessly. They all died because probably they deserved it. And the ones who didn't just railed on them and, you know, you're wrong and I'm right or something. But, man, you look. And when the Spirit of God begins to open the veil, the thing that Israel longed to meet with God and none of them could, none of them really saw the Lord for who he was. And all of a sudden, your heart is drawn out to him and and all of a sudden and this is the fact if you see him by the holy spirit in this manner by revelation you will never forget it you'll never forget it you'll never forget it you'll never forget it and you just go i mean i, I can i mean i'm sorry you know i know maybe it's stretched out for most people or or I believe once it begins, it never ends. But I remember the exact time when I saw what I'm talking about. I remember the exact place. The building is, doesn't even exist right here in Denton. And I was on a rooftop with some young college student at that time, and we were sharing the word. It was nighttime. We're laying on a slanted roof, roof, and I'm looking up at the stars, and I'm sharing Jesus with him, and the Holy Spirit started sharing Jesus with me. And everything that I had shared with this young man prior to that was, well, you know, the cross, everybody has to die. And, you know, but then Jesus is your life. And it was all, it was all what I'd been taught. It was everything I'd been taught. I was sharing what I understood by books and by men and God having, you know, shown me some things, you know, nuggets and treasures along the way. But all of a sudden, the Spirit of God went, and all of a sudden, I mean, and it was like, it was like the stars we were looking at. He just ripped it open. And there were depths upon depths of Christ that I couldn't even have imagined. And it was all the real Jesus. And then God slapped it shut. And he said, I'm going to spend the rest of your life teaching you this Jesus I just introduced you to at this very moment. And I've been in the ministry for years teaching Christ and him crucified. But I changed, and I didn't change instantly, but I changed inside to begin to match my ex exterior with the reality of the Christ that I had seen that had just devastated me. And I, and I remember my words were, Lord, if this is true, what you've shown me, who can be saved? Okay, here's what I meant. Who can live this but you? I mean, because I, you know, I mean, the contrast was me, Mr. Selfish, to that which was pure. And I was just like devastated. I went, I, I can't live this now. I don't, I'm not even close to this. Yeah, I can tell you all about the cross. Yes, I do good things. Yes, I was a missionary. Yes, I've done this. Yes, I've, I, you know, I've separated my life to serve Jesus. But how can I be saved? Who can be saved in light of this? And he said, well, with man it's not possible. But with God all things are possible. If it's God, if it's, his, if it's God, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in that way that they are. With God, all things are possible. That's how it happens. All things comes from that. And I'll be honest with you, it scared the fool out of me. And I shut my Bible and I was afraid. It was like I was afraid to look in there because it was not like anything that I'd ever heard of the greatest men that I'd ever heard teach this message or the greatest thing I'd ever seen. It was like, I, I can't, I can't go there. I mean, to to, to gain that is going to require, I, got, I really have to be gone. <laughs> to gain that, I'm going to have to lose. That's the faith. That's the faith. There it is. There it is.
Okay. Um, let's see. The next couple of subtitles, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, this whole sharing that I've started this semester on faith and the cross, um, the Lord, the Lord, years back, started putting this down for me. And he had me write it all down, and, you know, and then he gave it, then, then I went back through it, and I said, now, now put it in me. You know, you taught me, now put it in me. But it's, it's, it's very broad, and so I'm not always for sure uh, if everything's in the right order. I don't know. We'll see that more and more as we go. Uh, the early part I'm pretty confident in, but we'll, we'll see. But anyway, we want to, we, what we want to see now is the progression of faith because that, that and that, that's what we've been talking about, but we want to elaborate on it, that reality of, You know, the cross, that reality of the cross for my salvation, for my assurance, for my healing. Every, every ounce of that, you know, we say, oh, well, there's healing in the gospel. Amen? Or there, well, there is, but, but there's not. See, by his stripes, he took it, we could be healed. By his death, we could be saved. By his self-giving, elaborate, deep, profound depths of death and hurt, whereby we gain, we live as kings and he lives as a criminal, as a, you know, and he's God, and we're we're the worst. You understand? All right. Well, at first, you know, the the first thing that grabs you and me is this love. You know, but I think we get used to it after a while, and now, and after a while, we don't even think about as much the depth of the self-giving just so I could be healed. We just go, oh Lord, heal me or heal so and so. You know, because you're a healer. Because you're a healer. See? Well, I got news for you. That thinking is following Jesus of Nazareth as if he's still alive. You're not healed because he's a healer. If you were in the first century when Jesus walked, you were healed because he was a healer. But after he died, you're healed because his stride, he took it. Does that make sense? Do you, do you see the difference? Do you sure? Y'all see the difference? Yes. of that, here's, here's the important thing, like with healing. The basis of healing when he was Jesus of Nazareth was that he had the power to heal. Okay? Let me write it down. Set my little...
Right. So we have the cross in the middle, and over here on the left side is before the cross, so it's pre-cross. He came down and he had the power to heal, pre-cross. He was like a healer. Okay? You with me? Okay. All right. But after the cross, or post-cross, now you're healed by his stripes because selflessly he took those for you. And he bore it. All right. So after the cross, everything from God flows from the cross. But let's get more specific. It flows from the Lamb, doesn't it? Flows from the Lamb. All right. Doesn't flow from Jesus of Nazareth, the, the healer man. It flows from the Lamb. It, it flows from the selfless one. Okay? So we're wrong. We're not, we're not wrong like, well, you're, you're going to go to hell because you're a, a free cross healer dude or something. You know, that, those, those aren't the basis of, of, of hell or whatever. That's not, that's because the thing we're missing out on is not heaven. The thing we're missing out on is to know him, not what he does. To know his face, post-cross, not know his hands, pre-cross. What he can do with his hands. And so, this, so um, like I said, in the early going, it seems like, well, we, we, we're uh, so in love with Jesus. I mean, I was, and I know a lot of people were. I mean, it's just like, oh my God. Why would you get, why would you do this, you know? And, and the beauty of, of someone like you, and I just want you to be my savior, and, and in a sense, my king, my, I want to bow down and worship you because of your self-giving nature. Even though I didn't understand that, you see what I mean? But I could see it in the cross. I went, well, something's up here. You know? I mean, something's clearly different than the rest of us. And I like that. And, and in my case, coming to the Lord, I didn't like this. That's what brought me to Jesus. I'm thankful that I didn't like this. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's what brought me to Jesus. And I don't know about you, but that's brought, I went, God, I, you know, and he's, and when I immediately started going to Bible school and they said, well, you need to be dead. I went, yay. I remember that. I went, yes. They said, and Jesus will be your life. And I went, yay, thank God, you know. But some of the Bible school students went, no, I don't need to die. Why are they teaching me this? No, God needs me. I'm special, you know. I got, I got special gifts. These are pre-cross gifts. Yeah, you know. These are just me, the specialness of me. And... The Lord, the Lord looks at that and goes, everything must go down into death. Everything. And we go, but not, you know, I'm, I'm going to, like the, like the rich young ruler, I'm going to give you everything. And he's going, no, you won't either. Because you're a selfish little dude. I love you. <laughs> I do love you. <laughs> but you are a selfish little dude. You know. So, so that initial encounter, uh, you know, we call it repentance or whatever, but folks, it wasn't just conversion or repentance. It was, it was a dawning of, of what God really was like, but it was, we couldn't put it into words. All of us, all of us experienced that. I, I'm sure of it. It must have taken place. But then we start getting into the other stuff, you know, the other stuff other than Jesus. So we start getting into to gifts that are at the, at the bottom of the tree, and, you know, and we say, okay, well, healing and healing, and, you know, and we say, by his stripes I'm healed, but then we, we, and, you know, and Jesus did say, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, but we equate that with 
pre-cross Jesus who laid hands on him. But if you're not releasing the faith, which was his, his selfless giving and bearing all of those stripes for us, then you're just releasing faith that God will heal me because he's a healer man. He's like, come on, man, that's a big deal. Y'all are acting like, well, this is nothing. This is big stuff. <laughs> oh my God. This is huge to the Lord because it's the difference between following Jesus around going, oh, Jesus, you know, oh, Jesus, you know, touch me and then get it and go, yeah, and then going back home and telling everybody, it was, he was so wonderful, he touched me. Yeah, well, he'd like to touch you, all right, <laughs> with, you know, with a good dose of the cross, you know, because you're still alive and you still got all of this spizzerinkum that's not him, see. I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go tell everybody about the Jesus I met. And Jesus goes, hold up there, Skippy. You know, don't go tell anybody because you're talking about the wrong guy. Yeah, amen. So be it. Yeah. We go, well, why would Jesus, oh, he's just humble. He didn't want to tell anybody, you know. He just, oh, no. No, don't tell him, but it's okay. You know, I'm humble. No, he's going, I don't want people to start with the wrong Jesus. Okay. Well, what does that mean, Jesus? What does that mean? This is confusing. I want him to know that everything comes out of selfless giving. And when you were sitting there beside the road and I walked up and healed you in, in Nazareth, it wasn't selfless giving for me to lay hands on you and power come out of me and come in you and you go, Whoa, whoopee. But he said to bear every stripe that you should have borne and to bear all the punishment and for me to bear that and to say to you, you know, I, this is my faith and I will go into death for you and I will ask you to go into death for me eventually to be crucified with Christ to be crucified with Christ. I will ask you to live that way. I will justify you, but I will justify you so that you will live in the same way. Somebody says, what? If somebody hits you and you go, you, you misunderstood, that wasn't me. That was somebody else. You misunderstood. Instead of going, hit me again. Let my stripes be by Christ and let them bring you healing. Y'all heard the story, and I don't like telling my own personal stories because we think everything has to be that way, and it doesn't. But, but there's, a, there's a kernel of truth in some of these things. And I remember when, uh, and, and I, I don't know, maybe I've told this story fairly recently, but I remember when we were over on Maple Street and, and uh, church let out and, and we all went out the side door and everybody's going out that side door and it was a pretty day and everything. And this one lady in the church came up to me and she unloaded. I mean, she unloaded on me. And Jim, you might, probably, if I told you the name, you'd probably remember the incident. But anyway, she just flat right in front of everybody. She cut me up and dressed me down and, you know, flogged me in every kind of way that you can imagine. And I mean, with, uh, yeah, yeah, good, and on. I just stood there. And, uh, once she walked off and got in her car and drove off, of course, people were just stunned. So they walked over and said, they said, Randy, that, what she just said, that wasn't you. They said, that was, that was somebody else. She must have just got it wrong. They were trying to make me feel better. <clears throat> and they said, why didn't you speak up and just tell her? No, it wasn't me. It was so-and-so. And I said, I said, I can, I can take it. I said, I wouldn't want to unleash that on someone else who is weaker that might not be able to handle that. And I said, by her getting it all out, I bet you anything, that's the end of it. She's, she got her revenge. She got said what she needed. She got the poison out of her system. And, and I said, so I'm, I'm totally satisfied with how this turned out because I've, as a shepherd, I've saved somebody else from having to take this, even if they deserved it. 
You know, it doesn't matter. She's going to be all right now, too. <clears throat> well, the spirit that was working in me was not me. It's this, this stripes Jesus. You understand what I'm trying to say when I say it like this? This stripes Jesus. It's not, well, you know, I'll pray for her and she'll get healed or whatever. It's, you know... I'll bear these stripes. I mean, I've got the same Jesus in me that born for me when I've gotten healed all this time. Why can't I let Christ live in me to do that for someone else? What is, what is wrong with me if I can't do that? How selfish of me would it be? And, you know, you had that parable where, where, you know, the guy, you know, he sins against his master and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, he owed a certain amount of money and the master lets him go. And then, you know, he hears about it, and that guy goes and leaves the king and goes out and finds somebody who owed him way less than what he owed, grabs him, says, pay me, and the guy couldn't pay him, and he threw him in prison. And the king hears about this, this guy. He brings him in before him, and he says, it's the same thing. You saw that I bore stripes for you. And then I let you free on, based on that. And now you turn around and you have to, you know, get revenge or get your way on this. He's saying, you were justified, but you don't live by faith. See? See? Okay, so... So are we supposed to memorize every parable so that we can avoid this stuff? No, it's this spirit. We have to see the cross. We have to see the post-cross at work in us. We have to see the stripes are for us too, for others if necessary. We need to see that and want that. Want that. Want it. Somebody will be relieved. They will not have to bear these stripes. You know, and I've, I've done it. Tons of time when I, do, I, you know, and I say, well, okay, I'm a pastor. I, I mark it off to y'all, well, I'm a pastor. But it's not because I'm a pastor. I say that to relieve you. But many times I do that because it's Christ in me. It is Christ in me. And so I go, oh, you know, it's, so I say stuff like this. I can, I can, I can bear this. It's not that big a deal to me. I have Christ, you know. So. Why put that on you, right? Wouldn't that be right if anybody were in that situation? And we're not talking Randy. We're just talking. If anybody were in that, you just go, what? You know, just hit me, Lord. Hit me. <laughs> you know, just hit me. Just let, you know, let, let Nebuchadnezzar be your hand, your servant. My servant Nebuchadnezzar. That's what, that's what he called to Israel who fought again. I don't, this, this is wrong. This is, you know, and he says, it's just my hand. So Jeremiah bore the stripes that should have gone to Israel before they were sent into captivity. He did. He did. All the prophets, I want you to know that all the prophets were not just speakers of truth. They had to bear the very thing that they got from God because it can't just be that they're justified and saved. The just have to live by the same thing. Amen. So, so what is our task? Well, our task, first of all, is to really see this, the heart and soul and spirit of this reality of Christ crucified, the Lamb. And then the second thing is, let's let him live through us. And let's not gripe about it. Or let's not, you know, well, I'll lay down my life for this because this situation, you know, I can... You know, even if it's pure, but I can't lay down my life for this because it's not pure. <laughs> I don't even know what to say to all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's wrong. <laughs> anyway, we need to stop because. That is going, going. Hey Amen. We do, brother. I can't take any more of this. <laughs> I know. I, I knew that's what it was. 
<laughs> Let's pray. Oh, Father, father us into the spirit. We don't want to just call you Father and be, to live something contrary to who you are. We want you to father us into this nature, and you do it by the new birth. And you do it first by the new birth, being born again into it, and then you do it by the Spirit. And the Spirit will bring us into the spirit of the family. And the spirit of this family is selflessly giving ourselves for others, but it's not us doing it. It is us bearing about the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest so that death would work in us and life in others. We so want reality, Lord, and help this, help this group. And it's not just here, Lord. It's those in Ireland and those that, that uh, came even of the older group that have been there and just returning and, and Arizona and, Lord, in many different places. There is something you're trying to do, Father and Holy Spirit, to, to make it Jesus' time for a change. It's always been our time to make it his time and to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and strength and to have him first before us for a change and let him be Lord and us be the servants for a change instead of him serving us all the time. Lord, we ask you in Jesus' name to reveal this nature, this one in us, so that we may, as Paul, see it in you, Jesus, and then want it to be real in us so that we can die, that you may live in us, just like you died so that we could live. We will not be satisfied. We will not be satisfied without us above you. It is wrong. It is deeply wrong. It is an abomination. And we need to, it, it needs to make us sick, Father. We need to literally throw up because we see the vileness of it. And then we need to come to you and we need to, instead of all the vomit that was in us, we need to ask you to fill us with your life. Fill us with Christ, Father. Fill us with Jesus, Holy Spirit. We long for you. We love you. And we keep after you. We keep after you. We keep after you. Hmm. And help us to, to do things, not just do things on this earth, but do things before the Lord. Help us never to hew Agag, but only to do it before the Lord. And help us to see Agag when he rises up and not lightly think that's okay or, well, you know, not have secret little things going on in our heart that will protect something that should be cut to pieces. That was the end of Saul because of that. And it'll be the end of us if we keep protecting things that need to be slain. So, Lord, help us take on that heart that you have so that we will become sick and sick and we'll swing with vehemence and with commitment and, 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 and we'll stand with you like Levi, who is on the Lord's side, you said, and Levi stepped forward and slew his brethren, slew the stuff in the camps, in, the, in them that was not your son. So Lord, we, we, we want that, we want that commitment deep and strong and we want that discernment clear, crystal clear. That's me, that's not Jesus. I hate it already. I, even if it looks good, even if it feels good, I hate it. Because it is not you, Jesus, and you are my first love and I am returning to my first love. Yes, Lord. Lord, we want you to see it. We want you to just be moved in your heart when you see that we are moving in this manner towards you. Lord, that instead of becoming lovely and beautiful, we're, be we're working towards being a valley of dry bones with no flesh on these bones. And you'll look 
And you'll, you'll know when you ask the prophet, can these bones live? You knew they could because there's no flesh on them. Hallelujah. You knew they'd be raised up to a mighty army, and that's what your scriptures declare. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.